Yeah, thank you. Okay, so this is about Borg Backup. Um, it's about two and a half years old um, project, but the software is uh, quite a bit older because the project was forked from another project called Attic. So Attic was four or five years old when we forked it, so it's quite old but not very well known yet because uh, Attic did not get much advertising back then. Uh, some guy who found it in 2013 uh, from Greece, I think, uh, wrote about Attic, I found the holy grail of backups. So he was, was quite impressed by it. And for me, it was the same when I found Attic back then. It was quite kind of, oh, that's nice stuff. Let's, let's use this. I was using rsync before, and I just searched for something more modern. And after looking at a lot of tools, I found Attic, and it was somehow the best. And it was in Python, so I hacked on it, and um, we had to fork the project because the original project was not going on uh, quickly, and there was also no collaboration. So Borg Backup is kind of the fast-going Attic somehow now. Uh, this is a bit about me. I'm doing Python since about 2001. I think it started with Moin Moin Wiki project. That was basically the reason for me to learn Python. Also doing Linux uh, since it was on floppies, uh, free and open source software. Uh, these are some of the projects I was heavily involved in. So uh, the first one you maybe know from the python.org wiki. It, it's running on Moin Moin. Original author sitting here. <laughs> And I, author because I thought ah, yeah, okay, same story. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the second one is a dynamic DNS uh, service software written in Django. Uh, BPasty is a paste bin that can be used for binary stuff also. VPN uh, gateway is not a software project, it's basically just some configuration. And Borg Backup, you will soon hear the details. Uh, this is my email address at my company, and um, yeah, I'm doing Python development, so if you search for a freelance remote developer, talk to me. So about Borg, yeah, it's a backup tool. Yeah, there are dozens of backup tools, so there should be something special about it. And the special thing is uh, that a lot of tools are somehow a pain to use. They're either slow or not always working, or you can't use them on all platforms. And so this feature set, somehow it, it reads rather stupid simple, but uh, you will see uh, this is the special stuff somehow about Borg. So um, about simple, if each of your backup is a full backup, it's, it's very simple to manage. If you want to delete one, you can just delete it and it will not influence any, anything else. If you have the usual full and incremental and differential stuff, you have to be careful what you delete because it might influence other backups. If you want to restore stuff, you can just do a fuse mount and basically copy your files out of the backup archive or search for your files so you don't have to use a lot of command line commands to, to find your stuff. Uh, easy pruning, uh, you can basically define a policy. I want to keep uh, so-and-so hourly backups, so-and-so weekly backups, so-and-so daily backups, and it will just implement that policy. Uh, it's a one line of um, command. The tooling is also very simple. You have just the Borg software. You have SSH for remote uh, stuff, and you just write a shell script, and that's it. It's not a complex thing. There was also quite some good documentation and man pages and so on, uh, so you can look up stuff. Uh, we offer single file binary, so uh, if you just want to throw it on a machine and it should work, you can use that. 
so you don't need to install header files and compile stuff and do git checkout or uh, such stuff. It's just a file that includes everything, even Python and all libraries. And also, it's simple if you can just use the same backup tool on all your machines. So we support Linux, BSD, Mac OS X. Even under Windows, you can use it under Cygwin or with the Linux uh, subsystem on, uh, for Windows 10. There is no native Windows support yet because we have no Windows developer. But uh, we could do it if somebody would care for it. Uh, also, we support uh, a lot of file system features, so extended attributes, ACLs, and so on. And even if you have a strange architecture, there's this big engine, it also will work. So there's quite a lot of testing. About a point efficient, uh, it's extremely fast for unchanged files. So it's always a full backup that's done, but it will not feel like a full backup because it's so fast for unchanged files. It will basically feel like a differential backup, although the backup archive includes all the files, not only the changed ones. Uh, junk deduplication um, is important. It's not, not only deduplicating complete files if they are completely identical. It's enough if somehow a piece of the file is the same. Also, it's not caring about file names. It's just looking at the content. We'll see more details about this later. We also have flexible compression. So you can have, have, have it either very fast or very good compression. Uh, it's not flooding your file system cache. Uh, if, you, you, if you read uh, gigabytes of files all the time while doing your backup, usually your file uh, cache from the operating system uh, takes a lot of memory uh, and maybe you basically flood out other stuff that should be in the cache just by doing a backup and we avoid this by some special system calls. Uh, it's not only in Python, we also have a bit of C and Cython for being more efficient with memory and also being faster. And uh, we have a hardware accelerated cryptography just by using OpenSSL. So about safety, there are a lot of checksums. There is uh, some CRC32 on the low level basically, and there's also a lot of cryptographic hashing and macking going on. Uh, so if something is corrupt or so, we will notice it. We use transactions, so if you start a backup and somehow the machine crashes or the connection uh, goes down, there is no problem, it will just roll back the transaction. We are doing a lot of syncing to the file system, atomic file system operations, and um, the whole thing is like a key, a key value store, but it's log-like, so we always append at the end and at the beginning, we don't change stuff except if we delete it. So that's a rather safe thing uh, if something goes wrong. There are also checkpoints while you do the backup. So if you have a long going backup that runs for days, uh, it will do a checkpoint now and then. And if something goes wrong, you will just, uh, you will still have that stuff that you push to the repository. You will not have to completely start from the beginning. And you can use off-site repositories, uh, so if your house burns down, that's also kind of a safety feature. Uh, it's also secure. We are using authenticated encryption. So basically, the threat model is we don't trust the repository server. It could be at a hosting company or something. So if somebody looks inside your repository, he should not see anything because everything is encrypted, uh, the metadata, the data. Uh, because it's authenticated encryption, we can also detect tampering. So if somebody is playing with the bits and just toggling some bits, we will notice it because we checked this. Uh, there is SSH as a transport for remote repositories. So basically, you get all the uh, security properties from SSH. It, you will have a secure connection. And also, if you use key login, you will have a good authentication. And you don't have to care for an extra services uh, security issues concerning the network exposure. Uh, we also support a special append-only mode for repositories. It means that nothing will change at, that was already there. We only append at the end. So even if some bad guy is owning your client machine, 
and using Borg to delete stuff, he will not really delete it. The delete will just be recorded at the end, but nothing at the beginning will change, so you can just delete some files and everything will be as before. It's free and open source, so you can look in the code. About the crypto, some details. Of course, we encrypt client side because uh, the server is not trusted. Metadata and data, it's authenticated encryption. It's the encrypt then Mac mode. This is the more secure mode. And it's a counter mode of AES and um, HMAC SHA-256. Or since 1.1, uh, we also have this Blake 2B. It's also um, a hash or a Mac. Uh, it's just a lot of faster. Uh, we do counter management. Uh, it's important for this counter mode that you never repeat the counter value with the same key. And we have some sort of reservation going on. So even if the connection breaks down or something bad happens, it will never repeat counter values. Uh, the key material is either on the client or you can also store it in the repository, in the, in the config of the repository. The key itself is encrypted, so it's no problem. And the encryption is done with uh, PBKDF2 and AES. Um, the repository mode is a bit uh, nicer if you don't have a separate backup of your key. And we support uh, both the old and also the new one of uh, uh, version of OpenSSL. Uh, from OpenSSL, we only use libcrypto with the crypto primitives, so no, nothing complex, so that stuff should work quite okay. Uh, the compression stuff is chunk-based, so it's only a piece of the file, not a full file usually, except if the file is rather small. There are uh, some algorithms, fast algorithms, medium fast and rather slow, um, and you will get more or less good compression. Uh, a nice uh, thing with LZ4 is uh, it's often faster than if you use no compression at all. It, of course, leads, needs a little bit of time to do the compression, but you have to store less data to disk or to a remote server, so it saves more compression, uh, more time than it's, it's needing for the compression. In 1.1, we also have this auto mode. It uses LZ4 for prediction, basically. Can I compress this file? And if it looks good, then it uses expensive compression to uh, get even more out of it. And with Borg Recreate, you can even change the compression mode if you started with LZ4 and later you want something um, stronger. Um, about this deed application stuff, this is one of the main features of Borg. Um, you have to not only imagine it as somehow duplicate files in your file system, that is one dimension. You might have copies, so you have identical files on the same machine. Of course, uh, it will deduplicate these files. Also, if you have a virtual machine, maybe, uh, and a lot of zeros are coming from disk or, or from the kernel, when you read that file, it will deduplicate all those zeros also. This is basically the inner, duplic uh, inner duplication of the data set. It's just dupes inside your uh, source data. But there is also historical deduplication. If you're making full backups all the time, of course, most of your files will be the same and not change. Some files will change, but a lot of files just won't change, so it will also deduplicate them. And you can also have deduplication between machines. If you move files from one machine to another machine and you backup both machines to the same repository, it will just deduplicate it also because it already has that data. Or if you have the same operating system on all your machines, or if you have the same data on multiple machines. So these are basically the three dimensions of this deduplication. How does it work? It reads a file and then cuts, it cuts the file into variable length chunks. Uh, it decides by the content when it should cut so it's just a rolling hash that's computed, and if the hash says zero, it will cut. The nice thing about this, you could also cut at specific positions, but then you have a problem if, if your content is shifting a bit to the end or to the beginning, uh, then every chunk would change. But if you cut by content, uh, then the cutting places will also shift. Uh, it's very nice for virtual machine disk files. 
Um, usually not a whole file changes, but only some sectors basically in this virtual machine file. And it will only back up these new chunks and everything else that's still the same uh, is already in the repository. You can also rename huge directories and it will still have same content. So your repository is not growing. Uh, it can look like this. This is actual data from one of my repositories. And the nice value is this one. So you see, if I would have just used tar, I would need 22 terabytes of disk space. With tar GZ, it would be still 18 terabytes. And with the deduplication, it's just half a terabyte. So most of the stuff was somehow the same. This is this historical deduplication. And you see total chunks. This is basically the references to chunk IDs. And unique chunks is way less because a lot of chunk references are referencing the same chunk. Uh, in the next version, we will introduce multi-threading. Uh, currently, it's still single-threaded. And we plan to use 0MQ. So it will use more of your CPU, not just one or half, half of a core. Uh, the GIL might be no big issue because there is lots of I.O. and lots of C code. So uh, we can just release the GIL when uh, doing that stuff. And we will also do some, some crypto improvements and maybe go to OpenSSL 1.1 as a requirement. Uh, some stuff about a project. Uh, I have to hurry up a bit. Uh, we are using Python, size and C for the usual reasons. Uh, see if it's extremely important to save resources. Uh, Siphon is more or less glue code and interfacing stuff, and Python is the high-level logic. Uh, we use Cherry CI. Uh, it checks all the pull requests and all the branches and multiple Python versions. Uh, we use PyTest and Tox. PyTest is quite nice. Uh, it's not that much boilerplate uh, like uh, the normal unit test stuff. So it's actually fun to write code, uh, write tests. And Tox is on top of it, uh, running PyTest for every Python version. PyEnv is also nice. Uh, if you want to have a specific Python version, for example, 3.4.0, you usually don't get it in your distribution. You can just use PyEnv to install any version you like. And if you want to find somehow problems, then you always use the oldest point release, so the dot zero release, because there are the most bugs. And people might even have that version. So if you want to find everything, just use the oldest version. And of course, if you are building something you distribute, you rather use the latest version, because that's the best version. Uh, we also use a lot of virtual machines uh, and automate this with Vagrant. Uh, so we can test on all these operating systems. And even a PowerPC uh, virtual machine is possible using QEMU. And uh, if you do that, you have way less surprises. Oh, it doesn't work on X because you have tested it, so it usually works. Uh, Pi installer is also a nice thing. Uh, it's making uh, a one file binary of all the stuff you need to run your software. So there is the Python code inside, the Python interpreter, all the shared libraries. Uh, except the uh, glibc that needs to come from the operating system. But it's quite nice. You can just throw it onto your system and run it, and you are done. You don't need to install other stuff. Um, a word about secure releasing. If you think about it, a lot of people just download some binary somewhere and then run it as root. So what could go wrong? <laughs> uh, if the binary is tampered, it could even happen on the transmission, uh, then you have a problem. So maybe if you release software, especially if it's binary stuff, uh, maybe rather uh, sign it with GPG. Then people can really check if it is the same stuff that you have produced. If you just publish a hash like a SHA-256, it's better than nothing, but not much better, because the hash could also be tampered and if you check it, it will, of course, match. And an attacker can also compute a hash of the fake binary. So you really have to sign it with a, uh, a release key that only you have. Uh, setup tools, SCM is a nice tool. 
So usually you have to bump your version number somehow, increase from 1.0 to 1.1 or something. Uh, this tool automates this for you. You can just use tags in Git and setup tools SCM will just compute a version from it. And it's not only the release stuff, it's also the stuff in between. So if you output this in your tool, uh, you exactly know what a user is running. And it's no effort just uh, changing a few lines in your project and you can use it. Uh, Sphinx, maybe a lot of you know already. Uh, we have some special stuff. We build a lot of automatically from ArcPass. So all our usage docs and the man pages are basically extracted from Python code. So we don't have to maintain them separately. Um, if you have a readme for your project, maybe think of it as an elevator speech. So don't write the installation steps into it. Just try basically to sell uh, the stuff uh, because people read it and then decide if they use your stuff or not. So don't put a lot of other stuff in it. Uh, Read the Docs is quite nice. Uh, it hosts your documentation and it even supports multiple versions of your uh, software. So users can select whether they want to read docs about 1.0 or 1.1. They have nice mobile support, offer PDF as download, and they also use Sphinx. And they pull your stuff automatically from GitHub, so you don't have to care for the hosting. Uh, Askinema is somehow, it looks like a movie, but it's not really a movie. It's just some uh, uh, JavaScript interpreting a JSON file. And you can basically see it uh, typing, uh, you typing uh, commands and the output. Um, the nice thing is it's rather small. You can just commit it to your repository and you can even copy and paste stuff from it because it's not a video, it's just text output by a JavaScript. And if in the recording you made some typos, you can just edit the JSON file. You don't have to record your video again. Uh, we use GitHub. I think uh, most of you already know this. Uh, maybe worth mentioning is Bounty Source. Uh, so if you want to have a way for people to donate funds to you and make uh, fundraisers or um, basically put a bounty on fixing some issues, you can use Bounty Source for it. Uh, we basically, every donation we get uh, comes in over bounty source and I usually then just select some tickets and put some money on it. So basically the money gets distributed to the people who do the work and close this ticket. Yeah, milestones are quite nice for release planning and uh, you can re reuse um, your documentation for the GitHub uh, readme also. We have a community repository where people can just say, oh, I've read, written that nice script for Borg, and then we can just link to them. So, yeah, the usual GitHub features. Uh, the releases stuff is also quite nice because you can put all your binaries and source code there, and it's also uh, based on a tag in the repository. Yeah, the usual communication channels, we have a mailing list, IRC, Twitter, for support, discussion, release announcements. And you can help. We have a few developers currently, but could be more. Uh, just try it maybe. If you like it, test it, find bugs, improve docs, whatever. Uh, if you use Windows, and if you like Windows, we have no Windows developer yet, so that would be a good thing. Or if you use it, you can also donate funds via Bounty Source. And this is the homepage, and you can also grab me outside for questions. Do we have time for questions still? Ah, oh, yeah, okay. So, yeah, so I'm in time. Great. <laughs> Okay. Can you sync from a local repo to a remote or USB stick repo? Uh, you can uh, always you run the backup locally and then uh, stick it somewhere remote. You can always use, for example, R sync or R clone to just copy the stuff elsewhere. You just should not. Else, yeah. You just should not update both copies because that's 
causes crypto issues with the counters and stuff. Uh, but uh, I think quite some users basically do first the local backup and then somehow sync it to the cloud in case their house burns down or their company. So that's one uh, mode of operating it. We don't have direct cloud support. We just support uh, putting stuff into directories or talking client server over SSH, but then you need Borg at the other end so it won't work with Amazon or something, except if you run a server there. Yeah. And uh, the caching is, I think, what makes it really fast. And if you have multiple machines, is there a way to, to sync the, the caches between the machines? Uh, well, there are, there are multiple caches. Um, the question was about syncing caches between machines. Uh, usually, the, the local files cache uh, is about the files you have on that machine. So it won't be useful if you sync it to another machine because the files might be different. Um, there are also some other caches, but maybe you shouldn't do that. That's somehow um, too deep into the internals. Uh, there is one problem, by the way. Uh, if you use multiple machines and you push your stuff to the same repository, um, then you basically bring the cache out of sync with the repository. It's like cache coherency, the usual problem. Uh, then Borg will be a bit slower because it has to rebuild some caches first be be before it starts the backup if you do them alternatingly. So that's a bit of an unsolved problem yet. No, it's, it's locked. It, it might be possible in the future, but, but not right now. Uh, that, um, the call to not spoil the file system cache by pumping giga gigabytes of data is F advice. You can basically see, okay, I've read that data, but I, don't, I won't need it an, uh, anytime soon. So it basically just drops that cache. And there, is, there was some sort of a discussion whether that's good or bad if you do F advice, but I think uh, overall it is good to do it. There were some people with other opinions but I think if, if you always somehow flood the cache all the time, that's way worse than if you maybe F advise something that, that needs to get reloaded by some other process. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's a bit tricky. Uh, the point is we basically do it like Python. There are objects and there are references to these objects. And uh, the fast processing of unchanged files uh, works with this files cache. And in the files cache, it has the modification time or the, the uh, change time. It has the size of the file uh, and the inode number. And if all these did not change, the, the file is still the same. And it also has a list of the, of the chunk IDs. And then it will just create an item by using that information. It will basically create the metadata and uh, everything else, the data is already in the repository. Yeah, but it, it, it doesn't matter. It's, it's like a hard link. It doesn't matter if it's the first hard link or the second hard link. So it's just a, a, a reference basically. No, not yet, uh, but we have a JSON API meanwhile, so one could write a GUI now, but there is nothing usable yet, except some small web interface, but it's only for very basic use cases. Also, there's a Python tool that takes uh, command line programs and uh, makes GUIs for them. But not for Python 3, I think. Uh, I Yeah, you can do as many backups as you like. And it's even good uh, because you should not lose anything because it's completely deduplicated, so there is no redundancy, so better maybe have two of them or have a rather good hardware that does not lose data.
Yeah. But uh, just uh, mention that uh, the lightning talks will be oh, yeah. on okay. So feel free whatever you want. So if yeah. you want to leave, or you I will also be at the conference until Sunday at the sprints, for example. So just grab me any time. So, thank you.